Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome to the FKIS machine learning coffee seminar again. So as you notice, the, the event will be recorded. And today I have the pleasure to introduce you uh, my colleague, Professor Arto Klami from the University of Helsinki. And he will be talking about Markov chain Monte Carlo on Monge patches. And, and so you are again uh, welcome to ask the questions already during the presentation and I can then monitor the chat and, and then ask at the uh, good time. And, and of course, we will then have also the discussion after the presentation. But please, Arto, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to talk about my work. So when I say my work, uh, what I'm actually talking about today is, is joint work uh, with uh, my post of Marcelo Hartmann, who is in the audience, and we'll also be able to take the more difficult questions at the end of the talk if needed. And then uh, our collaborator, Mark Girolami from uh, UK. And uh, let's see, I have to, yeah. Uh, I'll start my talk with a bit of a warning or disclaimer. So this presentation is about uh, in the intersection of two somewhat mathematically heavy topics. So I'm talking about Bayesian statistics in particular posterior inference, uh, and I'm talking about differential geometry. And uh, this means that any talk that tries to cover the details of these would be suitable only for like a very few few of you maybe in the audience. So I decided to skip all mathematical details of both aspects. And I try to give you the overview of uh, where are we going to, what is our main goal, uh, and the overall main concepts on this path. Uh, I'm also talking about uh, still unpublished work that is ongoing uh, work and uh, we're working on the first papers right now. Uh, but the topic of today is, is Marco Chain Monte Carlo. I expect most of you mostly know what it is about. Uh, but the basic thing is that we are, the task is to just draw samples from a probability distribution that we don't really know. So we know the shape of the distribution, we don't know the normalization constant of this distribution, which is a kind of a critically important problem, especially in, in statistical modeling. Where, where these algorithms can be used to draw samples from the posterior distribution of a Bayesian model. Uh, and these are kind of iterative algorithms that you just have some point in your parameter space and you keep on updating that point, making small modifications, for example, by just walking randomly in this space according to suitable rules. And you hope to get a set of samples by just recording the trajectory of this sample when it traverses around this parameter space. In high dimensions, uh, the, what we actually care about is, is whether we can explore something called the typical set, which is actually the area that has high enough probability density, but also high enough volume. So on the right, I have some illustrations by the excellent paper by Michael Tefancourt that talks about this geometric intuition of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So here is like a two dimensional density plot without the contours. In the middle, we have the kind of high probability regions, the mode of the distribution. Outside here, we have the kind of low probability areas, the tails of the distribution. And what we actually care about is traversing this area that is somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's not at the mode of the distribution. So this is kind of a side view to this aspect. The mode of the distribution is too small. We don't really need to worry about too much about the parameter values that have the highest probability. Uh, but we need to worry about this to the concept. This is just a kind of geometric uh, conceptual illustration of uh, what makes this problem difficult. Uh, and the way this is nowadays solved is not by making some sort of a random walk that, that the kind of elementary uh, original algorithms for NCMC were doing, but instead the whole problem is recast as a numerical simulation of a suitable kind of physical system or an analog, uh, there's a physical analog to this system. So here's actually still illustrations from Michael's work uh, that you have, imagine that you have an earth here in the middle and it has the gravitation is being pulling your uh, 
particles towards the center of, of, the, of the Earth. We recast our sampling problem into one where this density, the target density that we want to sample from, is interpreted as this potential energy uh, of, of uh, this, these particles in this kind of physical uh, analog. And what we want to do is actually keep on kind of pushing our particles around to introduce some uh, kind of momentum or kinetic energy here uh, so that we end up moving along this typical set if we select our momentum suitably. So if you give the right amount of a push for, an, uh, let's say, a satellite on the orbit of the Earth, it actually retains the orbit and just keeps on going around there. So this is kind of the kind of very high level conceptual motivation of, of modern MCMC algorithms. But they are algorithmically simple. You just kind of keep on pushing your uh, particles to random directions. And then you simulate that how would they move these particles in this physical uh, kind of augmented dynamical system. And then you kind of just do the simulation for a while, and then you get your new posterior sample. The math behind this is a bit tricky. I don't, can't, can't now explain why this works. But this is kind of an important for the rest of our talk, because it converts this problem into one where we are simulating dynamics, the time evolution of these particles in some physical system. Here's an illustration uh, taken from a, a, an excellent kind of a visual uh, tool for exploring different kind of MCMC algorithms. So after the talk, you can go and see real kind of play around with these algorithms. But just to illustrate, so here we have contour plots of our target density. At some point, we are here, we have this particle uh, around here in this parameter space. We randomly decide to push it towards this uh, gray arrow here. And then we start simulating how would this object that is here at this potential surface and it's being pushed to that direction, how does it move? And we simulate it with discrete time steps for some time until we stop. And then very briefly about the math behind this. So uh, I'm showing you a lot of equations, but I'm not expecting you to really read any of them. So building on this augmented system idea, we can develop an algorithm called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which takes here we have the log density of the target distribution. So pi is the distribution that we are sampling from. Uh, Hamiltonian is, is our kind of an, defines the energy of this augmented system. And besides this log density, it has this uh, kinetic energy that is defined by the momentum of, of the movement direction uh, of these, these particles. And then some uh, called something called the mass matrix or metric tensor. And the numerical integration of how do we make these small steps around here is that we take solve uh, kind of the movement trajectories of these solidic derivatives of with respect to the parameters and derivatives with respect to the momentum and we need to kind of do these update rules we take half a step along this uh, uh, to update the parameter uh, the momentum parameters then we update the movement parameters then we again need to update the momentum parameters and so on don't need to uh, know the details there's this is one option of how you so simulate numerically uh, a time evolution of a physical system. This results in an algorithm called the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is the one that was illustrated also on the graphical uh, example. But now there, there are some freedoms in this algorithm. So there is this new kinetic energy that we are actually deciding ourselves. We are pushing our particles in any way that we want to. There is a freedom in choosing what we do. In practice, this P is always sampled pretty much always from a Gaussian distribution for convenience. 
But then we have this metric tensor M here that is arbitrary. We can choose it however we want to. And in practice, what is being done is that in all of these algorithms, if you, for example, look at Stan that uses Hamiltonian Monte Carlo as the inference engine, it selects this M by some sort of a tuning during the warm up of the sampler, possibly also during the sampling, it could be modified. And the basic idea is to just select the M so that it somehow stretches this parameter space so that the sampling is more efficient. But it's a global transformation. So it does help if your kind of posterior distribution is very elongated, it can squeeze it closer towards the sphere. But if there is some local area, so local kind of a spike of some kind or a funnel in your uh, uh, this typical set, then no M is going to be good at the same time for this region and for all the other regions in your parameter space. There is a better solution, which is uh, changing the underlying space. So this is when we start talking about uh, a bit more about the difference of geometry. We can also define our Hamiltonian so that it still has target density here. It still has kinetic energy, but we are changing the space so that we are having uh, this metric that defines the, how does the space behave. It's going to be position dependent. So for different parts of our parameter space, we are now going to stretch the space in a different manner. This kind of allows you, us to choose always locally how to look at our space. We'll get close, uh, talk more about that, that soon. Uh, this can be done for a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. You just plug in an arbitrary position dependent uh, metric here. And you can still do this numerical simulation of time evolution of your particles in this dynamics. It's more difficult. Now we actually have some, something called implicit equations. So we are updating our momentum and it actually depends on the gradient of this Hamiltonian at the updated momentum location. So you need some sort of fixed point algorithms for converging these, these update rules, but nevertheless, it can be done. Then there is the question of, uh, originally I said that the metric tensor M was arbitrary. Now we replaced with the position dependent metric tensor, but it's still arbitrary. You could still use any metric you want. The practical choice, proposed by Girolami and Calderhead and, and used by pretty much everyone who works with these things is the so-called Fisher information matrix. Uh, it's, it has this a bit nasty looking equation, don't need to worry about it. What it does in practice is that it stretches and rescales your parameter space locally to kind of align with the curvature of the, of the kind of density, probably the density that we are sampling. It's kind of nice. It has very nice theoretical uh, justifications, but I'm not going to here. It can only be used for the kind of posterior inference use cases for NCMC, not for sampling from arbitrary probability distributions, because it depends on the underlying probabilistic model. And actually, this is an expectation, uh, which means that in practice, it requires computing integrals over the model. And it may be actually difficult to compute this. But nevertheless, it can be done. It looks like uh, what we have on the right hand side for one particular example distribution. It actually helps tremendously. So this is an illustration from uh, Mark's uh, paper from, from 10 years ago. Uh, there's just a posterior distribution of some uh, not so complex model, a part of the simple model that still has a problematic area in the parameter space. In a Euclidean metric, we end up spending a lot of time exploring completely irrelevant regions of the parameter space. Whereas when we switch to this uh, metrics in, induced by the Fisher information matrix, it very rapidly gets to the part that, uh, that matters for this uh, problem. Yeah. Uh, 
it is kind of an intuitively very, very nice idea. We can treat, handle difficult parts of our parameter space by suitably selecting the kind of metric uh, at every position independently. Now there is of course a huge problem. So we don't use these algorithms in practice because they are so slow. They do explore the typical set much better, but every step of this numerical integration is now way slower than it would be in the Euclidean metric. So our Hamiltonian has this position dependent metric tensor. In all of these updates, we are going to take derivatives of the Hamiltonian at some points. And hence we need to compute the metric tensor at every point and we need to invert it every time we do this. And these are like implicit equations. So we are doing this fixed point convergence here. So what we end up doing is that during one step of our NCMC algorithm, we need end up inverting this metric tensor numerous times. And it's uh, in a high dimensional space, it's, it's D times D metric, times matrix. So the inverse is computationally uh, costly. So we have an algorithm that has very nice theoretical properties. It works very well in practice, but each individual step takes a long time. What we set out to do is, is thinking about, is there an alternative, uh, alternative metric that would have somehow similar properties as the Fisher information matrix has? in the sense that it somehow accounts for the local curvature of the target distribution, but that it would be fast to compute during this numerical simulation. And like I said earlier, the choice of the metric is completely free. We are free to use whatever metric we want to. So let's try and see whether we can derive a metric that is achieve similar kind of exploration of the parameter space, but does it faster. Uh, this is where we get to these more patches. So what we do is that we take our uh, logarithmic target density and we embed it as a manifold in a higher dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, so here's an illustration for a very simple distribution. It's the same one we actually saw earlier. We have contours. We just have two parameters here, x and y. It should be x1 and x2, actually. Uh, and then we take the logarithmic density of our distribution. Here it's a posterior distribution of a, of a simple Bayesian model, but we don't need to worry about that. Uh, and just represent our distribution as this manifold in this three-dimensional space. It's more like pretty much like the height map of any function. Uh, but it has this name of Mons patch after Caspard Mons. It's one of the founding fathers of, of differential geometry, a French mathematician from the 18th century. So we just, this we, has nothing to do with geometries or metrics yet. We just embedded our distribution as a manifold in this space. Uh, but now we turn our attention to differential geometry. And like I promised, I'm skipping all the details, so you don't need to worry about it. So in a differential geometry, we can think about things like uh, tangent uh, planes of this distribution. We can look at uh, these kind of uh, uh, contours that go on along these uh, manifolds. And what we can do is that we can define inner products on this manifold that is embedded in this higher dimensional space in different types of coordinate systems. We choose a one particular choice of these by, by doing this uh, mons patch representation, where the, based on the inner products, we can then derive quadratic forms for computing the, the metric tensor that end up looking pretty much like this. So we have our uh, manifold, we're taking derivatives with respect to different parameters and looking at the inner products of those. Because of the way our manifold was represented, these derivatives are actually very simple equations. We just had our, our representation was x itself and then this L, L of x. So when you take the derivative with one of the coordinates, it's just gonna be one at 
one of these coordinates and then the derivative of the rock density itself. And once we now look at the outer product of these, these derivatives, we actually get a metric tensor that in matrix form looks like what we have here at the bottom. It's an identity matrix plus an outer product of the gradient. So it's rank one plus diagonal matrix. This is simply one metric tensor derived for this particular embedding using a kind of basic properties of differential geometry. It has some nice properties that are very much aligned with uh, our goals. First of all, it has fast inverse. It's rank one, so we can use a simple equation to compute the, the inverse without requiring kind of explicit matrix inversion algorithms. Because of that, it also has fast determinants. Never mind actually the expression, this is for one particular special case of an ex a determinant that we need uh, during the later work. But you can imagine that because the inverse is fast, the determinant is going to be fast as well. There's also a concept called Christoffel symbols that is important in differential geometry. I don't even say what they are, but for this particular metric, uh, we also have a fast expression of computing this Christoffel symbol. We will, it's indexed by three different uh, terms, all going over the D dimensions, but we can compute them relatively fast. And now if we take a look at what does this metric look like? So we wanted a metric that somehow encodes the local curvature, maybe in a similar manner as the Fisher uh, information matrix that's already been demonstrated to be useful. Uh, here's it's just looking at one, one of these, our example posterior. Here's whatever the metric the Fisher information matrix induces. Here's the corresponding metric uh, induced by our uh, Mons patch embedding. It looks similar, but it's different. It should, even shouldn't be the same. Uh, but what we care about is that in these areas that are far away from the mode, it behaves in a similar manner. It's going to induce a movement that goes kind of along these uh, threads, uh, contours here. It also has some nice properties that that uh, kind of mode of the distribution, it's actually going to be an identity matrix. So it doesn't stretch the space at all in, in uh, the mode, mode of the distribution. So it looks kind of visually uh, reasonable. So let's then take a look at how does it work uh, in the context of uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo algorithm in general. Uh, we, demo we demonstrated until now in the case of one particular variant of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo called Lagrangian Monte Carlo. Uh, I don't go into details of what that algorithm uh, specifically does, but you can just think of it, it's almost the same as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but it gets rid of that if we operate in Riemannian geometries, it gets rid of the implicit equations we needed for numerical integration that the Riemannian manifold HMC has. And it does that by, instead of using momentum, it uses velocities that are pretty much just the momentums rescaled by the, the metric itself. So it has a very good properties. It has explicit numerical integration, which is typically faster. You get rid of these uh, 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 fixed point iterations. But because of this, it actually, the update rules themselves are much more uh, costly. In particular, we now have these Christoffel symbols that I mentioned before. And we actually have the D, D third uh, number of those. So in practice, this is again an algorithm that is in a naive way, it's usually slower than Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It needs a lot of computation for individual uh, operations. So it's not really being used very much, but it has this particular advantage over uh, HMC. Now, if we just take our metric and plug it in, and, and let Marcelo work on the equations for a couple of uh, days or weeks, we'll get completely explicit numeric uh, integrator for solving the dynamics in this uh, Riemannian metric that is induced by our uh, embedding. That is terribly ugly 
there's lots of uh, computation happening here, lots of uh, matrix and vector products and so on, but it doesn't have any matrix inverses. The Christoffel symbols that Lagrange and Monte Carlo needs have kind of disappeared because of simplification of photoscopter computation. Uh, and finally, this LMC also has uh, requires determinants when computing the accept reject check of the MCMC. We also don't need to do explicit determinant computations at that point. So we can do this. Uh, then we can take a look at does it work? So here's an illustration of taking one of the prototypical problem cases for uh, MCMC algorithms. This is like a target distribution that has this very narrow funnel going here. And you can kind of more or less choose either that your algorithm is good at exploring this area or that it's good at exploring this area. Here's what happens if you take a standard Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, here, even a more advanced variant uh, that called no U-turn sampling. Irrespective of what metric tensor you choose, it ends up having problems uh, in this. It doesn't actually even go to this uh, funnel area here, and then all the marginal distributions are going to be wrong. Our sampler in this new metric, it nicely covers the whole distribution, results in the nice uh, correct marginals. So it behaves well in the same sense as a Riemannian manifold HMC using the Fisher information metric would. Another example, uh, just looking at this kind of uh, probability distributions that are like uh, donuts uh, here. If you make them more and more narrow, it gets harder and harder to sample from them. Uh, we get nice coverage, nice exploration of the, of the distribution in all cases. Whereas uh, standard HMC in Euclidean metrics starts to be inefficient when you make these donuts more and more narrow. So to conclude, uh, where we are now is that uh, HMC has its own problems with difficult uh, areas of the posterior distribution. They can be solved by switching to a Riemannian metric where you just have this metric tensor defined for each position uh, separately. But the current algorithm is operating in the Fisher information with the Fisher information matrix as the metric tensor, they are computationally slow. What we're proposing is uh, a new metric that we obtain by embedding our target distribution as on this as a Mons patch in, in a high dimensional Euclidean space which has very nice theoretical properties. It has fast inverse, fast determinants, fast Christopher symbols. Uh, and it's the metric tensor itself is fast to compute. You don't need second derivatives. We only need the first order derivatives. And this is generally applicable for all sampling problems. We demonstrated in the case of Lagrange and Monte Carlo, where it formally removes all the computationally expensive steps all the inverses, all the slow determinants, uh, Christopher symbols. Uh, but it still, of course, requires quite a bit of computation per iteration. So where we are right now is that we have demonstrated that it makes sense. Uh, it works. We are, we are improving on computational efficiency of, of LMC. Uh, but we are not there yet in a sense that we would have an off-the-shelf state-of-the-art uh, MCMC algorithm, because there's also a lot of other aspects that are critically important for computational efficiency of these, like how many, what's the step size we take when we do this numerical simulation, how long do we do it, uh, and how to implement these things in an efficient and stable manner. So we are right now still working on these, working towards uh, getting this idea out, uh, but I'm personally very excited about the opportunity of having an MCMC algorithm operating in a Riemannian geometry with less computational cost compared to the current alternatives, so that we would actually end up using them in practice. So thanks everyone. That was my uh, surprisingly uh, exactly half an hour uh, presentation. And I'm, so I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, great, thank you, Arthur. That was very exact then. So do we have